Good morning. It's another beautiful Sunday in a hot, dry July. Rain has been promised and it is coming. Just like winter is coming, but winter's a long time away. <laughs> it's good to gather in worship. We still have people coming through the doors, so I'll be a few moments. You know, it's, it's something. We have people involved playing the piano, leading in worship songs, sitting at the back with the audio visual. And we have people that make coffee. By the way, if you like coffee, we have coffee after church. And we have people that work putting together the worship services. We don't see them much. They're sitting among you. Those that do it know who you are. Yes, indeed. And we have people that are involved with the community, our deacons, our elders are involved with the membership. We do a lot of things together because we believe that we need to be together. And we'll fellowship today as we meet here. Our opening song is Better Is One Day, It's Today. Better Is One Day, Today to be with you and you to be with us. After that, I will introduce our guest pastor and we'll proceed with the service. Let's stand to sing, Better Is One Day. you 
special thank you for the people at the back that make that screen go so fast that we can keep up with the songs. That's a wonderful thing. I have the privilege and opportunity this morning to introduce to you a gentleman that served our congregation 10 years ago for almost two years. And he helped us to see where we were and where we could be. And where we are today is in a great way due to the work of Pastor Ed Visser. Pastor Ed started his ministry in 1981. You know, there's a bunch of you that weren't even living then. And he still is working. He's enjoying bringing the word of God to various congregations. What he enjoys the most, though, is taking that big pickup truck he has out there and a great big fifth wheel trailer behind it and drags Gene all over the country. And he enjoys that. It is a good thing when you, we have our health and we're able to enjoy what the Lord has created. I give you now Pastor Ed Visser. Would you lead us in worship, please, and give us God's greeting. That was quite an introduction. <laughs> Even the sound system was... Uh, Anyway, it is good to be here. And so, congregation, our worship service begins with the words from Ephesians 3.21, and it is a prayer. And it says, to God, to the Father, be glory in the church, that's us, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So let it be today that in this congregation, however it is gathered here physically or virtually or by recording, that there is glory to our Heavenly Father in this church. God's greeting is intended to bless us with the truth and reality that we are loved and accepted, forgiven and cherished no matter what. So without exception, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, settle our anxious hearts. Fill our hungry minds with your truth. Save us, renew us, give us your strength and love. To you be the glory. Amen. Let's sing. Mighty to 
The two most important commands are that we love God with all that we are and all that we have, and love our neighbor, even our enemy, as we love ourselves. So let us come to God and seek the truth that will set us free, the truth that includes our sins and our shortcomings, our temptations, our doubts, our fears. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we confess that instead of loving our neighbors as ourselves, we put them into boxes that are too small for them. We confess that without a thought, we apply stereotypes to people that are superficial and wrong. Because some people have opinions, beliefs, and viewpoints that differ from ours, we are quick to label them as those people, not my tribe people, those who should be avoided or excluded from our circle, our family, even our church. Lord, we confess that we get caught up in the judgments that have already been made about people. We are prone to accept those judgments, doing little to find out the truth about people. Help us to be gracious as you have been gracious to us. We admit that all people, including us, are lost until you find us. We are blind until you open our eyes, and we are deaf until you open our ears. As you are gracious to us, help us to be gracious to all people. In Jesus' name, amen. We confess that we are lost until he finds us, that we are blind until he opens our eyes, and that we are deaf until he opens our ears. So let us worship God who gives people a new life, a new chance, and a new name. You are loved, you are found, and you are forgiven. So love one another as Jesus has loved you. Find one another as Jesus has found you. And forgive one another as Jesus forgives you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing, Just As I Am.
just before the service, I was going to welcome everybody here, but there was a couple here that they weren't here yet. And they came on their bicycles from Iowa. They're sitting over there behind the piano. I welcome the two of you. I also welcome all those that are watching, whether it's on Roger's Cable or if you're sitting in your living room. Welcome to this service. They're going from Iowa to Maine. I challenge you to do it from Maine to Iowa. That's against the wind all the way. <laughs> At this time of our service, generally speaking, we share what the Lord has given to us. And we share that with our church, our community, our denomination, our classes. And the deacons are asking us to share it also with World Renew. World Renew is an organization within the Christian Reformed Church that meets people's needs all around the world. Their physical needs and also their spiritual needs. So we have boxes or bags, or I'm not sure what they're, boxes I guess, on the table there if you wish to support either Cross Point Community or World Renew, you can do so there. I'd like now to lead you in prayer. Would you join with me, please? Heavenly Father, you've called us today to meet with you and your people and to listen to your word, to sing praises to your name, and to offer prayer. We thank you, O oh Lord, that your Son has given us instructions on how we should pray. And we ask, O oh Lord, that as we pray, if we forget anything, that the spirit that your Son has asked to be sent to us from you will speak on our behalf. And for that, we are ever grateful that we have help to meet with you. We are also very grateful for that final act that your son did so many years ago in giving his life so that we that believe in him may have life now and forever. We thank you, O Lord, that as we enjoy that life through bad times, through good times, that we may always remember that you are in charge. And sometimes that it's hard to fathom. We recognize that there are wars. They're on our television screens every day. There are killings. There are instances and events of injustice. And there's political unrest throughout the world. And yet, you call us to witness to your greatness, to your mercy, as we give of ourselves to those who fellowship with us, to those who live with us in our neighborhoods, and to those that we meet on the streets. Help us to do that in such a way that we show your light to those around us. We ask your Lord to be with Pastor Ed and his family, Robin, and children, Pastor Harold, pardon me, Pastor Harold, Robin, and his family as they are enjoying a number of weeks off. May they return to the ministry here refreshed and prepared to continue to show us the narrow way to life. We thank you for Pastor Ed and Jean who have traveled here to be part of our worship service today. And may the word that Pastor Ed brings to us from Luke, also resonate within our lives during this coming week. Lord, we also 
are aware that the elders will meet during this week, and we ask you, Lord, that you will be with them as they consider the various spiritual aspects of our worship and our fellowship. We ask you to be with our children as well, those that are enjoying the summer. We ask you, Lord, that they may do so in safety. We think also of those families that may be out and about enjoying a vacation. We ask you, Lord, that you will bring them back to our fold in such a way that they too can share with us what they have seen of what the things that you have made all over this world. With our worship today, O oh Lord, we trust that we will do it in such a way that your name is praised and you are glorified with our thankful living each day of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we will be rising to sing a song, When Peace Like a River. While we are singing that song, I'd like to invite, if there are any children, are there any children between the age of three and grade four with us today? Oh, I see some back there. Hi. Sunday school is right through that door, and John will open it for you, and then you can go on to Sunday school. But let's all stand now, and let's sing the song, When Peace Like a River.
The scripture this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke chapter 10. And I know it's going to be projected in all that. But maybe you'd like to follow along in the written page. And then you can keep it open before you just to make sure that what I'm saying is in fact what's written. Because I don't think you're going to remember it that well. It's found on page 1078 of your pew Bibles. 1028. Thank you. I went by memory. That didn't work. That's what happens when you get a little older. Let's pray before we read. Holy Spirit, as you breathed into the written word, will you breathe into our lives? Will you open our hearts, will you open our ears and our eyes that we may see and hear and know Jesus? In his name we pray, amen. Luke 10, 38 to 42, and it follows, that passage follows the story about the Good Samaritan, which you probably all know fairly well by heart. And if you compare the two, the passage of the Good Samaritan and this passage this morning, you'll see some interesting and very powerful differences. I won't explain that all this morning, but I just wanted you to note that, and you can see that more this afternoon. So now we're going to read from Luke 10, 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Imagine Jesus and his disciples coming by your home and you are the kind of person in who the, the gifts of hospitality and service run deep. Of course you open the door to your home and you invite Jesus and his disciples in and you want to give them some refreshments and perhaps even a meal. No matter that you may not have enough supplies in your house to feed a dozen or more people, a quick visit to the grocer would settle that. Maybe your sister can run out and get some supplies. You have everyone settled down in your living room while you get started on the preparations back in the kitchen. And for those of you here this morning who have done something like this for a large group, you know that there's much to do in preparation for refreshments and certainly a meal for that many people. You don't just order in pizza. You want to do this right. After all, it's Jesus that you're serving. Jesus is talking about some very interesting things with his disciples, and they are glued to him, hanging on every word that he says. And that's great, you think to yourself. I'm glad they are appreciating Jesus. I'm glad that I can provide my home and my living room and prepare a meal for them. It's a lot of work, but you love it. Your sister's come back from shopping. She'll be a big help. But oddly enough, she soon slips away out of the kitchen and ends up with the disciples in the living room listening to Jesus. Well, wait a minute here. That's not going to do. And you go into the living room and say to Jesus, 
Uh, do you mind releasing my sister and sending her back to help me in the kitchen? That makes good sense, doesn't it? That's what Martha thought, too. So it's a bit of a shocker that Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. Your sister has chosen the right one necessary thing, and I'm not going to take that from her. Oh, really? That doesn't sound like a fair judgment, worried and upset about many things, but Jesus said so, so it must be true. Now, before we go any further, we need to know that the Bible says in John 11, verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister, Mary, and their brother, Lazarus. So whatever happens in the kitchen and in the living room that day in Martha's house, Jesus' love for Martha is not in question. So what's the point? Is Jesus saying that Martha is wrong with her hospitality and service to Jesus and his disciples? Jesus does seem to be rewarding Mary for doing nothing but sit around in the living room listening to Jesus when there's a ton of work to be done back in the kitchen. So let's look at it once more and see what we can see. In the living room, Jesus is talking with his disciples. Martha's in the kitchen, getting everything ready, and given the number of people, she's faced with a considerable task. At first, things are going well, according to plan. The house is filled with the wonderful aroma of Martha's cooking. What is there not to admire about this? This woman has a gift. In fact, she's known for her gift of hospitality and her spirit of service and hard work. She's mentioned a number of times in Scripture for her gift of service and hospitality. Preparing meals, serving visitors and guests, opening her home to travels, defines who Martha is. This was her gifting. It was her purpose. In life and in God's kingdom, she loved serving. She loved helping, doing, preparing meals. The kitchen was her art studio where she prepared refreshments and snacks and hors d'oeuvres and meals. And the living room was her sanctuary where people, the invited guests, felt safe and they were nourished with delicious food and wonderful fellowship. Martha was doing only what came natural to her. It's how God made her, and she was known for it. When she opened her home to Jesus and, her, and his disciples, she was just practicing her God-given gift of hospitality and service. So she focused on the task, and she loved doing it. It was her ministry, and she was a, doing a good thing, serving Jesus and his disciples. Isn't that what we all should be doing? Practicing hospitality, opening our homes, opening our lives to make room for others so that we can help them and serve them and love them? Ought we not be opening our congregation to the life-weary travelers to bind their wounds and nourish their souls? The answer, of course, is, yeah, yeah we should. Well, at a certain point that day, it was clear that there was too much work to be done, and Martha was flustered. Mostly, mind you, because Martha was doing all the work by herself. Mary, her younger sister, normally helped in the kitchen, and perhaps she did this time too for a short while. Let's agree that Mary was helping in the kitchen, bringing Martha's wonderful hors d'oeuvres out and serving them to Jesus and his disciples. I can easily imagine that at first Mary would walk back and forth from the kitchen to the living room serving delicious snacks and so on. 
And as she did so, she would catch phrases of very interesting and compelling things coming from Jesus. So it didn't take long for Mary to stop going back and forth. She just stayed, stayed in the living room and sat at the feet of Jesus, listening to him, completely focused on his words, forgetting all about Martha. Martha is now not so much serving as she is slaving in the kitchen. And it was beginning to show on Martha. She was becoming irritated, irritated with Mary. Mary, who should have understood Martha's ministry and work of service and that she would naturally need some help in the kitchen. Had we been there in the living room that day, I'm sure that we would have heard some pots and pans making more noise than usual. And even some deep sighs from Martha that were loud enough that we in the living room could have heard them. Finally, she could take no more. She came out of the kitchen, wiped her brow, went right up to Jesus, and am I reading this right? Verse 40. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Lord, don't you care? I'm doing my best to serve you and your disciples, but it's too much for me without help. Don't you care that Mary has left me, left me to do the work, all the work by myself? Mary is out here sitting on her duff doing nothing. And then the great surprise. She not only chides Jesus for not caring, but now commands him, tell her to help me. Very bold and nervy of Martha, don't you think? Perhaps she hoped to embarrass Mary so that Mary would scurry back to the kitchen. Maybe she said it quietly to Jesus. Luke does make a point of mentioning that she came up to him, maybe to whisper in Jesus' ear, don't you care? Tell her to help me. However she did it, she was bold enough to get in Jesus' face about it interrupting his teaching, questioning his care about her, and commanding him to tell Mary to get back to the kitchen. Why wouldn't Martha just call for Mary from the door of the kitchen? Something like, uh, sorry to interrupt, Jesus, but Mary, would you mind coming back to the kitchen and helping me for a bit? Why command Jesus to instruct Mary to help Martha? I've wondered about that, haven't you? So what's really happening here? Well, the key is in the word distracted. Martha was distracted. Her gift and practice of hospitality and service were legendary. But the word tells, the word distracted tells us that on this occasion something was wrong. Very wrong. Luke tells us Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. All the work in the kitchen was distracting her from something. Okay, here it comes. Her ministry of serving Jesus was distracting her from listening to Jesus. Mary decided to leave the kitchen and to start listening to Jesus, to really listen to him and his words. She chose, said Jesus, the better thing. Lots of things to be done, but Mary chose the better thing. She sat at his feet, which in those days meant complete submission and focus on Jesus and his words. But Martha, oh, Martha, so busy working for Jesus that she was distracted from listening to Jesus. 
That was the problem. So busy serving Jesus, she was distracted from listening to Jesus. Her ministry was wonderful. Jesus didn't question that. He treats her gently. Someone suggested hearing what he said as something like this. Martha, Martha, you know, after her big outburst. Martha, Martha, it's okay. You've done good things, and I appreciate it. We all do. But Martha, you forgot something. You forgot to put me first. Mary has understood that. She has understood that it's not about her, but it's about me. You forgot that, Martha. It's not about any one of us. It's first of all about Jesus. It's not first of all about our ministry and about our gifting and how hard we're working serving the Lord and working in his kingdom and breaking a sweat and doing all of these wonderful good things. It's not first of all about our work and our hospitality. Our primary purpose, our first calling is to love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. It's the first and it's the most important commandment. Nothing may get in the way of that. Not even your good work, not even your God-given gifts and abilities, not your ministry, not your service, not the, your theology, not your, even your opinions and your feelings about all sorts of things, not even your earnest fight against evil. Remember what Jesus said to that church in Ephesus, Revelations chapter 2, 1 to 4, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. You have persevered, and you have endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. I suppose anyone serious about living the Christian life would love to hear a commendation like that. It's like hearing well done, good and faithful servant. We long to hear that. But it's the next sentence in the letter to the church that indicates there's a big problem. Jesus says, Yet I hold this against you, you who have worked tirelessly for my name. I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. They were hard at work. They were right, they were true, but they lost their focus, their first love, Jesus himself. Martha, Martha, I know your deeds, your hard work. You have persevered in your ministry of service and hospitality, but Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen to love God first. But what about the meal then for more than a dozen people? And what about the hors d'oeuvres and all the preparations? Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, implying we could easily do with less food and drink. Just keep it simple. Just keep it simple. I'm sure that Jesus would not have objected if Martha would have just ordered in pizza and spent more time listening to him rather than fussing in the kitchen, trying to serve him. Martha, your gift of hospitality, of opening your home to weary travelers needs to be secondary to the hospitality of opening your heart to me and giving me your full attention and your full worship. It's not first of all what we do for the Lord, it's first of all what the Lord does for us. And we need to be in his face, as it were, at his feet, having him tell us about that. If you're so busy doing for the Lord that you can no longer sit at his feet, there's something very wrong. If you're so busy working for God 
that you're distracted from loving God above all, then there's something very wrong. This is about people so busy serving the Lord that they don't have time for the Lord. Well, what do you think? Does that mean that we should just stop working altogether? Stop serving the Lord, stop serving people, helping them out, and just sit at the feet of Jesus? Well, yes and no. It's a matter of priority. It's really a matter of first importance. First love God, then love your neighbor. Before Jesus did anything in his ministry, he would spend time alone in prayer with his Father who is in heaven. He would sit at the feet of his Father from whom he would receive direction and love and power and encouragement to do the work of ministry and to do it his Father's way. Jesus himself said he didn't do anything that he didn't see his Father doing. So before we engage in any good work or ministry, no matter how powerful that gift is in you, and certainly before we're distracted by all that good work, let's sit at the feet of Jesus. Let's choose that one thing needful. And then we'll learn from him and we'll receive life from him and insight from him and working in a way that pleases him. We will learn about living a life of gratitude, sitting at the feet of him who loves us. We will come to love Jesus and find ourselves loving one another, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven up and being patient with one another. We will discover that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of his mouth. Sit at the feet of Jesus, listening, learning, enjoying, giving him glory, following him, doing what he says. Because in the end, what counts is not our mighty deeds and works, but the mighty acts of God. Centrally, what God has done in Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection. When you sit at the feet of Jesus, focusing on him, Jesus will open your eyes to show you what the Father is doing by the cross and resurrection in your life, in your family, in your congregation, in your city, in your nation, in this world. And then you can follow him and use his gifts to serve. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for being gentle with all of us. But thank you also for addressing us when we get flustered and bent out of shape as Martha was and redirecting and refocusing her and us. Sometimes, Lord, it's true. We are so busy and so convinced that our hard work is essential for the kingdom, for the family, for our community. Thank you for opening our eyes so that we may see that loving you is of first importance and that we really can't do the other without knowing you, loving you, and being loved by you. I thank you, Lord, for this congregation and her members, and I ask that you will bless them, that you will keep them strong in you and in your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing Living Hope.
Brothers and sisters, continue to grow in the grace of and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen.